G'day. Welcome to this time together. It's a pleasure to be sharing it with you. A time to worship our God. Hear the words of the psalmist from Psalm 17. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Saviour of the, those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. We come in the promise of the steadfast love of God, seeking shelter in his hand. We come because he is the one who inclines his ear to us. God is the one who listens to our cry and responds in grace and love. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we thank you for your presence with us, for the ways in which you come to us day by day, moment by moment, speaking into our lives. And we pray this day that in your love you would Anoint us afresh with your spirit and move us in new ways. Come, Holy God, reveal yourself to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Have you ever worked alongside someone else, someone senior, someone more knowledgeable, someone with more skill, someone who showed you the way? I know that for myself, it is the way that I learn best in doing, in being mentored. Whilst I love books, reading it and then going and doing it, it's not quite the same. And I remember many years ago when, uh, because of a bit of a temper, one of my mum's cupboard doors ended up with a hole in it and my grandfather just turned up with his toolbox and some paint and he taught me how to fix it. Skills that are still with me 40 years later. I think of all of those of my friends who have done formal apprenticeships. I think of when I was a student nurse and a senior nurse took me under their wing. And those times where I became that senior nurse. Times where I looked at junior nurses and thought, don't you know anything? Realising how much I had learned and it had just become part of who I was. I had forgotten that these things were learnt behaviours, learnt knowledge, for they had just become part of me. 
I look at Jesus and the way he gathers the 12 around him and encourages them to learn. Friends, our world is in desperate need of women and men who will give of themselves the time, the energy and the skills to mentor the next generation in all sorts of things. There's something uh, very special about watching young people learning and conversely watching older people learn from younger people. But there is a skill. There is a way to do it well. And it is not to snatch it away from the other and say, this is how you do it, do, 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 do. Leaving the other going, uh, but rather to work through step by step. I remember when I was training to be a nurse and we had to do uh, some physics. And as someone who did physics to year 12, uh, the basic physics was, was not that complicated for me. So it was a fairly cruisy class. And the mathematics involved was what I thought was simple. But some of those that I trained with, particularly those that were mature age students and hadn't done formal mathematics for 10, 15, 20 years, the mathematics was challenging. I remember sitting down one day in a cafeteria trying to explain some basic procedures and, and I was doing the mathematics and I wasn't writing out every step because I was doing small steps in my head. The poor person that I was with was just going, Rob, you've lost me. And I'm like, how did I lose you? And we had to go back and have the conversation, give each other the time and the respect to find out where they'd got to and where I had left them because I jumped ahead too quick. And then I had to slowly go through what I'd done in my head and unpack it and unlearn it and present to someone else that which I did innately. Being a disciple of Jesus is exactly that process. It's looking to Jesus and learning from him. Discipling each other in the journey is pausing and taking the time to encourage, to explain, to listen to questions, to give space for the other, to wrestle, to succeed, to stumble, to recover. I wonder whether we are ready to give that time to each other, that we all might grow as disciples of Jesus apprentices in the mission of God, willing participants in the task of the salvation of all things. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the way in which you give your time and yourself to us that we might grow in faith, and discipleship. We pray this day that we might seek your spirit, that we might humble ourselves before you and follow in your ways. For Lord God, we are overwhelmed by your compassion and we want to see your healing and hope and peace and joy spread to all corners of the earth. Lord, we particularly pray this day for those that feel that they have been forgotten in their illnesses, in their loneliness, in the violence that has taken hold in their lives, in the droughts, and the floods, 
in the small places and in the big places. Lord, for all those who feel forgotten, may they know your presence, your love, your power. May they know they are children of God. Lord, we lift up these and all of our prayers to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in song. from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, starting at verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, 
he had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he told the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. For context, we need to know. When Jesus heard what had happened, when he had heard of the beheading of his cousin John, of the price paid for being a prophet, for, for being faithful, to the call of God, he went to a remote place and yet the crowds found him there. And so he ministered to them. And at a point in time, his disciples came and said, Oh, Jesus, look, this mob are getting hungry. We ain't got nothing. Send them away. Jesus says, You do it. You feed them. And they go, but all we've got is five loaves and two fish. And she says, bring it in. And having received it and given a blessing, he handed it back to them and they distributed it and all were fed. This is the genius of God. Humanity, nurturing humanity, and bringing life to this creation. This is how God works. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have the story of the beginning, where humanity, made in the image of God, are given a role to care for and oversee all of creation. Many uh, translations use the word dominion. And, and for many of us, we have a really negative sense of what dominion means. We have an earth, um, human, power struggle sense of that word. We have an authoritarian sense of that word, not a responsibility sense of that word. To have dominion is to have oversight, is to have authority, but also to have responsibility for. And usually in human interactions, that's the bit we forget. We exercise our authority and our power over, but we do not give of ourselves to care for and administer. And yet in the garden, that is the task given to humanity, to care for this globe, to care for this precious creation and all that is in it. Not ours. We didn't make it. God's. And yet God says, come. Come and be part of this. In the image of God, bearing the characteristics of God, the heart of God, the intent of God, the love and the care and the compassion of God, the creativity and the life-bringing capacity of God. And in that space, there is a role for humanity to name all the creatures that come forth and an instruction to be fruitful and multiply to be part of this task of bringing life to the whole of creation. That is humanity's role. And we hang our heads in shame 
at how destructive we have been, how counter this role we have been. And that is the story of the brokenness and the sin that we read in Genesis. Humanity given a role, a life giving role, becomes something that brings not life, but death. Death of relationships, death generally to the earth. And we're still wrestling with that now. And the more we learn about our behaviours and our impacts, the more we can see how destructive we've been and how lacking in wisdom we are as the apex predator on the earth. We actively work to destroy it. And yet our commission is to care for it, to bring forth life in it, to be fruitful. This is the genius of God and the sin of humanity. The genius of God comes to the people of Israel. They are formed as a specific people with specific role to declare God's praise. Isaiah 43, the people who have formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. And that's not just banner waving and, and, and loud noise, but to say, folks, come. Come and praise God, for God is the source of life. And as we praise God, life comes into us. And once it comes into us, it flows through us and blesses the world. The nation of Israel was called to be a kingdom, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a people who would take the good news of God and God's generosity, God's life-giving agenda, and share it with the world. For this is what God has called the people to to be bearers and sharers of God's blessing. In Genesis 12, it reads like this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is God. God just doesn't create the world and go, there it is, um, here I am. God says, hey, humanity, come and be part of the good stuff. Come and be part of the blessing. Come and be part of the bringing of life to the world. We see that in the many references in Old Testament scripture to the nation that says, unlike all the other nations that oppress and cause hardship on aliens, on foreigners, this nation will be one where they are cared for. There shall be one law for the native and the alien who resides among you. Exodus 12. This is this God who says, come and be part of what I'm doing. Come and have a role in this most beautiful, most exciting, most life-giving task. God says to the people, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19. And we're not talking, you know, green men, big eyes, aliens. We're talking people from another place. Foreigners. People who aren't necessarily part of our tribe. And the word to the people of Israel is, you know what it's like 
to be that other, the people from away, the foreigner. And you know what it's like to be oppressed and enslaved and treated like third class citizens or indeed not citizens, slaves. And you will not be like that. Because God is a God of life. God is a God of bringing good news to people. And instead of being an oppressor like the nations, you, O Israel, will be a liberator and a bringer of life. You will be part of God's saving works for the whole of creation. This is God. The God who says, I created. Now, folks, get involved. Partner with me in this. Be part of what's going on. And yet we know that Adam and Eve stepped away from their wrong. That Israel failed to embrace its wrong. That we, as followers of Jesus, called to love God and love our neighbour, abandon our wrong. Our failure like all those who have gone before us, is a failure to love and in loving bring life to a world in need. And yet that is the call of God. And we look up and we go, oh, how do we do that? We look to Jesus as the one. And Jesus comes into the world as the Son of God, tasked with this great task of God, the saving work for the whole of creation. And Jesus says, I need some apprentices. I need some disciples. I need some people with whom I can share this mission and role with. See, God is not a God who has created the world, turned it on, and sitting back in his sun deck, watching and waiting to see what happens. And God is not a God who stomps in and takes away the tools from everybody else and says, oh, you're useless. Indeed, that's the story of Noah. The story of the rainbow is the story of God's word that says, no, I'm not going to, Clear the table and start again. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to mould you and fill you with my spirit that you might be my agents of mercy and grace. And so we see in the person of Jesus, the one who calls the 12, who sends out the 70, who again and again, invites us to be involved in the mission of God. This is the Jesus who in the Great Commission says, go into the whole world, baptizing all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That Jesus hands to us the opportunity to bring life to others, not to impose religion, not to impose rules and regulations, but to help others discover the love of God that is being offered. And as we hear that opportunity given to us, as we reflect on that and go, oh, wow, as I have received, so I now give. As I have been blessed, so I now bless. Really important that we look again to Jesus and we go, Oh, Jesus, Son of God, you did what you did as a man, as a human being in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we too need to put our hand up and go, God, come upon us with the power of your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Move us mightily. Transform us. Renew us. Grow in us that which will enable us to most fully get on board with what you're doing. 
And so we see it in this passage. Where when the disciples come to Jesus, effectively saying, can we just get rid of this mob? Jesus says, no, they're in need. Care for them. And the disciples go, well, all right, but we ain't got nothing. Jesus says, show me what you got. And in Jesus, in the prayer of Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, what they had was enough. And the same is true for you and I, as individuals and as the church. As we face the opportunities that are ours in the life around us, to bring life to others, to love others, to care and to make a difference in Jesus, in prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit is all that we need to do our bit for the kingdom of God. Not to earn God's tick of approval. But to embrace the character of the one in whose image we are made. The one of ultimate compassion and steadfast love. So friends, let's open our eyes and our hearts and see the opportunities that are ours to bring life to this incredible place, to bring hope and light into the lives of those around us. Let us embrace the heart of God and love the world. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your commitment to all people and we pray this day that we might fully embrace who you are and what you have in store for us. Come in power upon each of us this day. We claim in the precious name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit, in our lives, transforming who we are, that we might more fully live who we are meant to be. We thank you, Lord God, for including us in your plans, for involving us in your mission and for the precious opportunity we have to bless others and to see life blooming in unexpected places, unexpected lives and unexpected situations. Holy God, Work your miracles through us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. I believe in one God the Father. I believe in Jesus is Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. All three are one. I believe that He made all the heavens, and the earth is the work of His hands. From the vastness of space to the most secret place, He commands. i mm-hmm.
of God. Go and fulfill your destiny. Go and be a child of God, enthralled by the things of God to bring hope to the world. Amen. Living here with us today Creation always occupies his mind. 